Well, this morning I come to talk to you about the fact that, and we've already sung about it, that Jesus is always with us. In Psalms 46, we read, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though, it water, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. I should be hearing an a- amen right now. Amen. God in, is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. You should hear hallelujah right now, friends. Hallelujah. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow the bow, and shatters the spears. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then from Mark 6. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, It is I, have no fear. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Jesus was with them, and he is with us. And I realized this morning as we're singing, Jesus is on your wall because it's all about Jesus. So let us pray again. Lord, I come before you and you've laid a message on my heart to bring forth this morning. But God, may I stand behind the cross, not in front of it, and may the hearer, whether online or in this room, see you, experience you, because it's all about you. And I ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. And know that I know that I know that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. So before this incident on the water, what leads up to it is that Jesus has sent the 12 disciples out to proclaim the good news. And they come back rejoicing because even the evil spirits, the evil spirits, submit to them. And Jesus' reputation is spreading. Even the Roman governor, 
Herod has heard of him. But Jesus is also grieving. His best friend, his cousin, the one who God sent to come before him and to pave the way for Jesus has been beheaded. And Jesus is in pain. And the disciples return to Jesus after being out spreading the good news. And they need rest. Jesus understands this. They are exhausted. And so they go to get away. But the multitudes, the crowds, they follow them. And Jesus preaches to them. Brings them the good news. And the disciples are there with him. And they say, send the crowd away because they need something to eat. Now, on the one hand, that sounds very, very good. But on the other hand, I'm suspicious. Send them away because we need rest. That's why we came here in the first place. But Jesus doesn't send them away. He says, what do you have? And then he breaks the loaves and the fish and feeds them. And the disciples don't understand, even at that point, who Jesus is. And I can get down on the disciples at times. But in reality, I have to ask the question of myself. Jesus, do I really know who you are? Is my heart hard that I can't understand who you really are? Well, Jesus sends them on ahead, and he goes up on the mountain to pray. And they're going across the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee is only seven miles wide at its widest. But we're told earlier in Mark that he is ministering in his home area, which was around Capernaum. And he sends them to Bethsaida, if I can say that word, Bethsaida. So it's not very far. But the wind is against them. Now, I have never rode a boat much, but I do ride bicycles. And I do know that when the wind is against me, when you have those 15 mile an hour, 20 mile an hour gusts, 25 mile an hour gusts, you can be going downhill and it feels like you're going uphill. You better work really hard, a lot harder, when the wind is in your face. And not only was the wind in their face, but the waves were crashing around them. They were struggling. And as we walk through life on this earth, have you ever felt like the wind is against you? Have you ever felt like the waves are going to beat you down and you're never going to make it out of where you are in that moment, that time. And so what is Jesus doing? What is he about in those moments? And Mark tells us, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. But what did he do? He didn't say, seas be calm, wind stop. He just watched them. Because he was praying. And we're not told what he was praying about. But my hunch is he was praying for them. Praying for them. And asking the Father, what to do? Right. 
You see, their hearts were hardened. They didn't understand who Jesus was. And sometimes I have to admit, I don't understand, as I've already said, who Jesus is. And what I have to be reminded of, that Jesus, why Jesus came to this earth. Yes, he came to this earth to die for our sins. He came to this earth to lead us into all truth. And he sent the Holy Spirit, even when he left the face of the earth, to do that very thing. But growing up in the church, as I did, what I thought was it was always just to get to heaven. One day I'll get to heaven and everything will be hunky-dory. I don't know if that's an Indiana word or not, but it is a Western New York word. (laughs) But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth. And how heaven was going to come to earth, because Jesus already knew what was going to happen. He already knew he was going to the cross. He already knew he was going to die for our sins. He already knew he was going to be resurrected. But they didn't. And sometimes we don't remember that. Because Jesus knew that they were going to, what they were going to face after he left the earth. And we read about it in Acts. And he knew that they weren't ready. And they needed to know who Jesus really was. And the fact that their mission was to bring heaven to earth. And if it was their mission, it's our mission as well, because anyone who says that they're a follower of Jesus, anyone who says that I'm a disciple of Jesus, it's our mission to bring heaven to earth. Wherever we are, in a classroom, at work, in an organization we belong to, in our neighborhood, wherever we are, we are Jesus' witnesses to bring heaven to earth. Now, as I was growing up, I said I grew up in the church. There's a picture of Jesus. Well, when they talked about this story, that they would put up on Remember flannel boards? Does anybody here remember flannel boards? Yeah, they put up on a flannel board. And this was the picture that I saw. And notice, notice the water's relatively calm. And if the water was this calm, the disciples would have been able to get across very easily. And also notice that Jesus is tiptoeing. Now, I don't know what the, what the, the artist was trying to portray here, but... I don't see Jesus as one who tiptoes. This, I believe, is a better picture of who Jesus is. The waves are crashing around him, and he is walking through those waves. The world around him was chaotic. Water in Scripture means two different things. One is water is the source of life, and the other is it's chaos, where evil resides in that chaos. And Jesus came to enter into that evil world. And what he's calling us to do is to enter into that evil world to bring heaven to earth, to bring heaven to those things that are evil. starts inside us and then it moves out transforms us and then we become Jesus' transformational agents wherever we are but here's something that really bothers me he meant to pass them he wasn't even going to stop he was going to walk right by he wasn't even going to wave 
Jesus, what in the world are you doing? Again, I believe he had more in mind than, than I can comprehend, but it was to help them understand who he was, that he was not just a great prophet, someone who could heal and bring restoration. He was the Messiah, the one who came to transform this earthly world. And then Jesus says this, when they see him, they're, they're afraid. He says, take heart, it is I, have no fear. And then he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. I saw some heads nod when I started talking about you feel like the world's against you. Like the waves are beating you down and the wind is in your face. I've been there. And when I was there, it was hard for me to see Jesus. As a counselor, I've been in counseling. And I was going through a rough patch in life, much to my own making. Because I was a workaholic. Yeah, I was working in a church, but I was working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And when you do that, you burn out. But, more, but what else also happens is you burn up relationships with my wife, with my kids, with the people I worked with. And so I'm in counseling. And the counselor's going through, there's things, Dave, that are driving you. There's things that happen to you. And they're having an impact upon your life right now. And you're, you're reacting to those things that happened to you. And he said, and he kept bringing up my mom and my dad. And I said, it's not my mom and it's not my dad. And he says, well, well who is it? And I said, I don't know. That's why I'm coming to see you. And he said, well, I want you to go, and I want you to just meditate on that, and I want you to pray. And so I went home, and I meditated, and I prayed. And I asked Jesus, what's going on inside me? Prayed that prayer of Psalms 139, if there be any wicked or hurtful way within you, Lord, lead me into the way everlasting. One of my mentors, who your pastor mentioned a few weeks ago, his name's David. One of the things that he said to, to me, said to, to us, he said, the most underutilized gift that God has given us is our imagination. Because in our imagination, we can cross over into the spiritual realm. And what I've come to understand is that if you ask Jesus what he was up to when those things were going on in your life, he will show up. Now, I don't know how God speaks to you or how you experience God, but this is what I do know. I know the one who knows, and that's Jesus. And he will... You will experience him and hear him in ways... If you just are still and allow him to speak, especially about those instances that have hurt you and harmed you and the people who've used you and abused you. And so this is what happened. I asked Jesus, where, where are you? What, 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 what do I need to get in touch with? And I saw myself sitting on a tractor. I grew up on a dairy farm. 
And I'm 10 years old, and I'm driving that tractor, which, by the way, when my son turned 10, there's no way in the world I would have allowed him to do this. <laughs> but I'm driving the tractor, and we're baling hay. I'm on the tractor. doesn't have power steering. I'm 10 years old. I'm just a little runt. I still am. <laughs> and I'm trying to steer that, that tractor and keep the baler on the windrow is picking up the hay to make the bales. And my uncle is on the wagon stacking the bales. And I couldn't keep that baler on the windrow. And my uncle was a World War II vet, fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And his older brother said that when he came home, he was a different person. And he didn't say anything to me, but I knew he was extremely angry with me just by the words that were coming out of his mouth and the, his behavior. And it made me feel like I'll never be able to do it, no matter what. And that, that was pretty much my life experience with him. It would never be good enough. In fact, I could do something the way he told me to do it, and the next time he, I did it and did it exactly the way he told me, it was wrong again. And I said, Jesus, where were you? What were you doing? And as God is my witness, I'm sitting on Jesus' lap on that tractor. And he says, Dave, you're okay. It will be okay, and you're okay. I'm here with you. And healing came, and it was transformational in my life. You can experience that, Jesus. And if you don't have faith that you can experience that, Jesus, I'll have faith for you. One of the worst things you can say to a person is when they're going through a struggle is just have more faith. Please stop doing that. Instead, say this. I'll have faith for you. I get that from the four guys that lowered their friend down through the roof, tore open the roof, who the the guy on the mat was lame. They lower him down to the roof. And Jesus looks at them and says, your faith has healed him. It wasn't the guy on the, on the mat. It was their faith. And as ambassadors for Jesus, as his witness, we are the ones to have the faith for those who are going through difficult times. And if your life is anything like mine, you'll need others to have faith for you. So the finally says, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. The good news is they, they did get it. They did get it. And you and I, we're here today because they got it. They got it. In Psalms 46, 10 through 11, be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The God of Jacob is your refuge. And although this morning you may not be ready to say, Jesus, search my heart. You know if there be any wicked or hurtful way within and then leave me in the way everlasting? And you may not be ready to say, Jesus, what were you up to when that happened to me? Is there something I need to hear from you? But I would encourage you this afternoon or tonight as you lay your head down on the pillow 
pray that prayer. Jesus, I went through some hard times. And it's still affecting me. I need to hear from you. I need to know what you're up to. Come, Lord Jesus. Please stand. So, Lord, just right now, we just ask you, God, that as we turn our eyes to you, God, as we invite you into those circumstances, God, whatever they may be, God, that you would reveal where you were, that everything else would fade away, but God, that your truth would remain. Lord, let us hold tightly to where you are. So when you, when you are in the midst of a storm of life and have been pulling on the oars that seem like forever, and when you're exhausted because you are furiously trying to find a place of rest, not knowing if you'll ever get to the other side of the sea, 
wondering if there's even another side and asking, will this pain end? Will my life ever be the same again? Is there any hope joy will come tomorrow? It is then, remember, the Lord of hosts, Jesus, is with you. God is our refuge. So God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I just pray for those under the sound of my voice and those online. God, that you, your Holy Spirit, would fall upon them now and bring rest and peace and joy and hope. And may they experientially receive the love that we've been singing about, your love, and that they will know that they know that they know that they are loved. And it's in the name of your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.